We are on what I've been calling God's Game of Thrones, season two, and this is going to be episode number two. You see, the Bible is about kings and kingdoms, and all throughout the Bible, you see these kings, and some of the greatest stories involve these kings, and if you ask the average person, go to any church, ask the average person in there, say, what can you tell me about Jeroboam in the Bible, and they're going to have no idea. And they're cheating themselves because this is some of the greatest stories in all of the Bible. This time we're going to be looking at King Jeroboam. And this is a very interesting character. And here's a brief description of Jeroboam. He's Israel's first king of the divided kingdom. And he reigns 22 years during the days of Rehoboam, Abijam, and Asa. And see, those are kings of Judah. you got to recognize that... There's kings of Israel, and then there's kings of Judah, because it's the divided kingdom. Now, his spiritual state is always evil. I mean, he's bad all the way through. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. Notice he's not from the tribe of Judah. He's from Ephraim. His parents are Nebat, that's his father, and Zeruah, that's his mother. And the Bible verses you'll find him in. Is First Kings eleven twenty six through fourteen twenty and Second Chronicles chapter ten through chapter thirteen, and his prophets are Ahijah and an unnamed man of God, and his name means let the people contend. So the story of Jeroboam begins a little bit before King Rehoboam. Remember last time we did a whole lesson on King Rehoboam, the man that forsook wise counsel. You know, Solomon's son that, you know, took, that reigned in his stead. Solomon is still king when uh, Jeroboam shows up and he sees Jeroboam. Solomon is impressed with him because he was a mighty man of valor and industrious. So Solomon makes him ruler over, over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And since King Solomon has turned his heart from the Lord... The Lord has raised up adversaries against him, and one of them just happens to be the man he chose, which is Jeroboam. And the Lord sends Ahijah, his preacher, his prophet, to Jeroboam and lets him know that the kingdom is going to be divided. And Ahijah says, by the word of the Lord, that Jeroboam will rule ten of the twelve tribes. And the reason he's not getting all of them is just for David's sake. But the Lord even promises to prosper and take care of Jeroboam if he will walk in the way of the Lord. Look at 1 Kings eleven thirty eight through 40. It says, And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and will build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee, and I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt, unto Shishak king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So Jeroboam will be in Egypt until Rehoboam becomes king. Remember that the story of Jeroboam happens a little bit before Rehoboam. Well, he shows up a little bit before Rehoboam. And we saw the reign of Rehoboam in the last episode. So go back and listen to that if you, if you haven't already. But Rehoboam and Jeroboam reign at the same time as Jeroboam's reign stretches out through the reign of Rehoboam. And not just him, but also Abijam and Asa. He reigns a long time, 22 years. So with that quick background information... I'm going to give you 13 similarities between Jeroboam and the Antichrist. Jeroboam is a type of the Antichrist, and that number 13 is significant. But the first thing, the first similarity, both of them promote other gods. Jeroboam was afraid for Israel to go to Jerusalem to the house of the Lord. He was afraid that they would get over there and their hearts would get right with the Lord again and they would leave him and go under King Rehoboam and serve him. So he makes two gold calves and he says to Israel, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 
Notice that Jeroboam didn't care if they worshipped a god as long as they didn't worship the true god. So he made these false gods. And the devil is the same way. He doesn't care who you worship as long as God doesn't get the worship. The Antichrist will want direct worship eventually. However, I believe there will be a time when he does promote idols of silver and gold just like Jeroboam. And the reason I believe that is in Revelation 9.20. If you look at Revelation 9.20, it says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. You see, they're worshiping the same kind of idols that they worship back here in 1 Kings. Both Jeroboam and the Antichrist promote false gods. A wicked ruler wants you to worship something other than God because it is hard to control a true God-fearing man with convictions. The moment a man starts living his life by a King James Bible and serving the true God of the Bible, that man is hard to control because he's got convictions. And if you're going to start pushing something that goes against his convictions, he's going to be the first one to... Uh, resist everything you're saying. But the Antichrist and Jeroboam, they promote false gods. The next thing is they persuade with convenience. Look at 1 Kings 12, 25 through 29. It says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam king of Judah. You see, that's why he made those gods, those false gods. He was afraid that they were going to go back to Jerusalem, to the house of the Lord, and get their heart right. And their hearts would be turned to Rehoboam and start serving Rehoboam, king of Judah, who wasn't a good king, but he wasn't as bad off as Jeroboam. And Rehoboam did do good for about three years. But it says in verse 28, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. So notice that Jeroboam is persuading them with convenience. He said it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. And that is exactly what the devil does in the life of a Christian. He will tell you the Christian walk is too hard. The devil will say you already do enough. Uh, he doesn't want to make you better, but he wants to make you worse. He doesn't want you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he says just stay at home. Don't go out. Don't, don't do anything. Just, just stay at home. Don't do anything for the Lord. You can just stay at home and read the Bible. Don't, do, don't witness to anybody at work. You do enough. You read the Bible. You know, anything he can, get, he can do to stop you from doing more. And that's what Jeroboam did. He said, he said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. So the Antichrist will do the same thing. He persuades with convenience. We are living in a world that is all about that very thing, about things being convenient. The devil is quickly getting the lifestyle and mindset of people ready to serve the beast. The Antichrist is going to have everything set up to where if you have taken his mark and worship him, then it will be convenient for you while you're here. In Revelation 13, 17, it says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Do you know how convenient it will be to buy, sell, clock into work, clock out of work, start your car, enter your house, and do basically everything you do with something the devil puts in your right hand and in your forehead? The convenience is going to be at an all-time high. And we already see the stage being set for it. You want to buy something at the store, just put your hand up to something and pay for it. We already see the stage being set for it. When I enter my workplace, they scan my forehead for a temperature. When you enter certain places, they require a mask or you can't buy or sell. It's not a sin to wear a mask. It isn't a sin to get your temperature checked. But at the same time, though, do you see where all this is headed? And all for some virus that most people are surviving over? I mean, 
The big shots of this world love to trick the little guys into things by persuading them with convenience. They make them think they're taking care of them. And they are really taking care of themselves. Jeroboam was no different. He didn't want Israel to worship God. He didn't want them to leave him for Rehoboam. He was protecting his own life. So he says unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. And he wants, he made it convenient for them. He said, I'm going to make you guys over here. It's not that far of a drive. It's just, it's a much easier drive. Just go worship over here. So, he persuades with convenience. The next thing, his priests are for devils. Just like the Antichrist. In 1 Kings 12, 30 through 31, it says, And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even in Adan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Not only did Jeroboam make his own house to worship in, he also made his own priests. These priests didn't even come from the right tribe. You see, God commanded that the priests come from the tribe of Levi, specifically Aaron and his sons. The same way God chooses men like Paul, who was an apostle, not of men, neither by man, the devil also chooses men. And today there are people who are ordained to fight the gospel, just like Christian men are to preach the gospel. The devil's got his men, God's got his men. Jeroboam was the devil's man, and he was choosing uh, some, some more men for the devil. In the church age we're currently in, we, we are called a priesthood. If you're a Bible believer, then you believe, believe in the priesthood of the believer. As 1 Peter 2, 5 talks about, it says, we're an unholy priesthood. We offer up spiritual sacrifices. This is something different than what they had in the Old Testament with the priestly tribe of Levi. And the devil's counterfeit today for it are the priests in the Roman Catholic Church. The devil has set up his own priests just like Jeroboam did to counterfeit the Lord. And during the future time of the end, the Antichrist will for a time endorse the Roman Catholic Church before he gets direct worship. And you read about this in Revelation 17 through 18. You can read about the great whore, Mystery Babylon. Uh, the Antichrist will have his pedophile priests. This is a counterfeit priesthood, just like Jeroboam had a counterfeit priesthood. Those Roman Catholic church priests are priests for devils. Jeroboam has priests for devils. Uh, the Roman Catholic priests are forbidden to marry. And do you know what Paul calls this doctrine? A doctrine of a devil. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. So that's another similarity between Jeroboam and the Antichrist. Their priests are for devils. And next, they both partake in signs. In 1 Kings 13, 1 through 3, in 1 Kings 13, you're going to see Jeroboam versus the unnamed man of God. God gets this unnamed man of God to come and preach against what Jeroboam's doing, against his altar, against this false god worship. And you, you see what happens here. It says in verse 1, And behold... There came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Not only does God send a young man of God to preach to Jeroboam, but he is going to give signs while he does it. And Jeroboam is going to be on the receiving end of this sign. He's going to partake in the sign because unbelieving Jews require a sign. And... The Antichrist also has signs associated with his ministry, with his story. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The false prophet and Antichrist will both have power to perform signs in Revelation 11, or Revelation 13, 11 through 13. Uh, 13. It says, He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So be careful about trying to look for a sign. 
Today we operate by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Jesus told Thomas, More blessed is he who hath not seen and hath believed. But Jeroboam, he, he heard the preaching, and he saw a sign, and he still didn't. He still didn't listen. But the next thing, another similarity, both of them pushes new times and laws. In 1 Kings 12, 32 through 33, it says, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. So he is making a counterfeit feast because he doesn't want Israel to do the things of God. He doesn't want their heart to be turned back to God. So he makes a counterfeit feast. And it says, And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves which he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So there's those uh, pervert priests. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month, listen to this, which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burned incense. So Jeroboam took it upon himself to ordain a new feast and make his own dates to do so. He did what he devised in his own heart. The Antichrist does the same thing. In Daniel 7, 25, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. So they both they both push new times and laws. And both of them have prophets against them. We just read in 1 Kings 13, 1 through 3, how the, the, the young man of God is preaching against the altar, the golden calves, and the horrible things Jeroboam has started for Israel. And if you see the rulers of this world doing something, and 90% of the preachers are against it, then it's probably wrong. How many Bible-believing preachers do you know that agree with what is going on in this country right now? Not many. So what does that tell you? What's going on is obviously wrong and against the Bible. And this young man of God, this prophet, him and Ahijah are both against Jeroboam. The prophets are against Jeroboam. Two prophets show up in the time of the end as well that are against the Antichrist. The Antichrist hates them so much that he has them killed. Look at Revelation seven through uh, Revelation 11, 7 through 8. It says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Notice that Jeroboam also wants to kill the young prophet. Uh, he doesn't, but the young prophet ends up with his dead body laying on the ground by the end of the chapter. If you read the whole chapter, you'll see this young man of God ends up dead. Just like the body of the two witnesses will lay in the street. So the similarities are there. In 1 Kings 13, 3 through 4, it says, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign. Because the Jews require a sign, which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it, into him again, pull it in again to him. You have signs going on because in the Old Testament, God is dealing with Jews that require a sign. And here in 1 Kings 13, you have a sign of the dried up hand. And you have signs that are going to go on in the tribulation at the same time that the Antichrist is going to be working. But both men, the Antichrist and Jeroboam, the prophets are against them. The next thing, they're both past feeling. In 1 Kings 13, 4, and it says, It came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. You can quickly see that the king has no regard for the life of the prophet. He hates what the preacher says. He is willing to kill anyone who gets in the way of his wicked heart's desire. And he doesn't care that the message is from the Lord, even though he knows it is. And this isn't his first run-in 
with a prophet from God. The Antichrist will be the same way. It says in Daniel eleven thirty seven, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. You see, eventually the Antichrist is going to want direct worship. He's going to want the people to directly worship him. He's not going to regard anybody or anything, only himself. He's past feeling. During the days of the coming Antichrist, the sin of the world will be so dominant that the love of the people serving him will wax cold. Matthew 24, 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And when you get so, off, so far off into sin like King Jeroboam, you begin to have unnatural affection. You will begin to be unfazed by the death of others, the torment of others, the sadness of others. And you won't care about anyone but you and your sin. They're both past feeling. The next thing is that prophecy of the dried up hand or arm in the case of the Antichrist. So Jeroboam gets his hand dried up and the Antichrist has the same thing happen to him. There's a prophecy of the Antichrist dried up arm. In Zechariah eleven seventeen, it says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So the Antichrist will get a deadly head wound. Then he will resurrect, and he will have a... He's going to... You see how it said his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. And that's why little Nas X advertises his Satan shoes covering up his right eye. Got that right eye darkened. Everywhere you look, you see that right eye covered. 1 Kings 13, 4, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. Notice that Jeroboam's reaction to truthful preaching is rebellion. You can tell so much about how a person reacts to hard, truthful, and negative preaching. But look what he says here in 1 Kings 13, 5 through 6. The altar was also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So Jeroboam's hand is healed, just like the Antichrist gets a deadly wound, and he gets healed in Revelation 13. Both have these things happen to them, similar things, both get healed. The next thing is, they're both pretenders. After Jeroboam gets his hand dried up, the king, the king Jeroboam, he starts pretending. And the thing that the prophet said immediately came to pass, showing that he was a true man of God. You'll notice that Jeroboam asks help from the man of God. Deep down, he knows where to go for help. And you're going to see how he pretend, pretends to be friends with the man of God because he thinks it's going to benefit him. In 1 Kings 13, 5 through 6, it says, The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. Many lost people come to church. They talk to the preacher because they're in sorrow about how their life is going. However, they just don't have a repentant heart about how vile they are. They're in sorrow about how they don't like their life, but they're not in sorrow about their self. They may turn over a new leaf, but they never believe the gospel. There's tons of people like that. King Jeroboam's like that. In verse 7, it says, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. So Jeroboam would actually take his reward. He's not going to give him one. He would take one. There are men who will take your reward from you if you participate in their wickedness. In Revelation 3.11 it says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Second John 1 John 1.8 Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So there's a chance you won't re receive a full reward. And 
Jeroboam would have took the young man of God's reward if he would have went home with him. I wouldn't go home with Jeroboam either. He might try to touch me or something. A lot of these old kings were okay with the Sodomites. They liked those pedophile priests. Uh, 1 Kings 13, 8, And the man of God said unto the king, If thou will give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. So he was not for sale. Elijah tells Ahab that he sold himself to work evil on the side of the Lord. The devil wants you to be a sellout for him. He said to Jesus Christ, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. He wants to give you something in exchange for worship. But you are not for sale. 1 Kings 13, 9 through 10. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou comest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now this story reminds me of Proverbs 23, which is referring to the Antichrist. Proverbs 23, 1 through 7. It says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. And put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Seize from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat, not, eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. There's that. I, one eye showing up again. Neither desire thou his dainty meats, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. That proverb reminds me of Jeroboam. It reminds me of the Antichrist. And if you're going to eat during the days of the Antichrist, then you have to take his mark and worship him. And if a person does this, they lose everything when it comes to the things of God. There would be no reward. If anything, they take your reward if you go home with them and eat with them. The Antichrist is a pretender. He pretends to be for the people, so he's the people's choice. This will be how he deceives. And the Bible says he will come in peaceably. In Daniel eleven twenty one, it says, In his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Watch out for people always trying to flatter you. Many times they're just pretenders. And you'll also see that the wife of Jeroboam is a pretender. Just like the bride of the Antichrist is a pretender. Remember how we talked about the great whore in Revelation 17 through 18? She is a counterfeit of the bride of Christ. She is the Roman Catholic Church. She's nothing but a pretender. When the world thinks of Christianity, they don't think of us. They don't think of Bible believers. They think of Catholics. The great pretenders, the great whore, the Roman Catholic Church, the greatest pretender of all time. Unless you have your Bible down, you're going to be deceived by her. You know how sometimes a man gets drunk and he has beer goggles on? He thinks everyone he gets with is Miss America when he has his beer goggles on? Well, if you get your Bible goggles on, then you'll see right through the great whore. She will no longer look like Eve before the fall. She will look like Jezebel after the, after the dogs got a hold of her. But look at this great pretender in Revelation 17. This is the bride of Satan. Something like the bride of Chucky. In Revelation 17, 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. She's got a horse forehead, which has got 666 on it. Now I'm going to show you Jeroboam's wife, who is like the Antichrist's wife. She is a pretender. In 1 Kings 14, 1 through 2, it says, And at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is a Hijah the prophet, which told me that I should be the king be king over this people notice that jeroboam knows to go to the man of god when trouble comes lost people many times know where to go and they just don't want to many times and first kings fourteen three it says and take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey and go to him he shall tell thee what shall become of the child he knew that ahijah could tell the future because he had already done it he had already done it back in uh 
in the previous chapter, in 1 Kings 14, 4 through 5, it says, And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah, but Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. You're going to find out Ahijah has more, Ahijah can see better spiritually than Jeroboam can see physically. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. She ain't nothing but a faker. She's a pretender. Not everyone is what they claim to be. And if you don't filter them through the word of God, then you'll also be fooled. Before Marissa's pretender showed up, Ahijah had already gotten a word from the Lord. The reason Christians are so deceived today, the reason they get uh, deceived by these pretenders is because they haven't, haven't gotten a word from the Lord since the day that they got saved. But you need to be like Ahijah, get you a word from the Lord. When that pretender shows up at your door, you're not going to be deceived. In 1 Kings 14, 6, it says, And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. If you have gotten a word from the Lord, you'll spot a Jehovah's Witness before you even open the door. You'll know by the sound of their feet, by the, by the sound of their knocking. How ugly are the feet of them that preach a gospel that Paul didn't preach. Jeroboam is Mr. Pretender. His wife is Mrs. Pretender. Although if they is here today, they probably wouldn't like those pronouns. I'm going to get rid of them. And they probably wouldn't like Mr. Potato Head either. But a great picture of the Antichrist and his ugly bride out of hell is Jeroboam and his wife. They came out looking like the corpse bride and the crypt keeper if you have your Bible goggles on. Now, they're both pretenders. And the next thing, Jeroboam and the Antichrist both provoke God to anger. Jeroboam makes the God of heaven full of wrath. Notice the message Ahijah has for Mrs. Pretender to go back and tell Mr. Pretender when she goes back home. In 1 Kings 14, 7 through 8, it says, Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes. You'll notice the kings are compared to King David, the model king. King David is a picture of Jesus Christ, and when the Antichrist, the counterfeit king, is placed up against the king of kings the lord jesus christ you'll see he is so pale in comparison that he almost needs to switch horse colors in revelation 6 2 through 8 he needs to quit being a counterfeit and jump off that white horse and get on the pale horse because he is pale in comparison to the lord jesus christ the king of kings and lord of lords in first kings 14 9 it says but hast done evil above all that were before thee for thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Jeroboam cast the Lord behind his back. That is what the Antichrist does. He wants rid of the Lord and he will sit in the temple claiming to be God as it talks about in Second Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24. And 1 Kings fourteen ten through 11 says, Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it all be gone. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat for the Lord has spoken it. The same way Jeroboam provokes the Lord to anger so does the Antichrist provoke the Lord to anger. He makes him so mad that in 2 Thessalonians 1 8 it says in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Jesus comes back in flaming fire and in vengeance and in fury. He's going to thresh the heathen in his anger. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, 2, 8, it says, And then shall that wicked, the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord is coming back at the second coming in fury, and he's going to cast the Antichrist into the lake of fire. Both Jeroboam and the Antichrist severely provoke the Lord to anger. And the next thing, both the Jeroboam and the Antichrist pressure men to sin. In 1 Kings 14, 16, and it says, 
and he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin, and who made Israel to sin. Can you imagine the greater damnation that Jeroboam is feeling in the flames of hell right now? He didn't just sin. He made his own religion and damned souls to hell with that religion. He's no different than Joseph Smith or Ellen G. White. He made his own religion. Revelation twenty one twenty seven talks about how those who maketh a lie will not enter into the city. Jeroboam didn't just sin. He made a lie with a false religion and damned people to hell with it. And his sin affected the nations for years, even after his death. Joseph Smith, the lie he made, is still damning people to hell to this very day. I imagine that every day, uh, some uh, God has an angel or something go down there to hell and turn up the thermometer or on uh, Joseph Smith down there in hell. Crank it up a little bit on him every day. Because each day, I mean, more and more people is going to hell because of the lie that he made. The Antichrist also pressures men to sin through the mark of the beast system. In Revelation 13, 16 through 17, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in the foreheads, and that no man might buy ourselves self, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. The pressure to literally sell your soul to the devil during that future tribulation time period, it's going to be at an all-time high. You, know, you won't be able to do anything unless you turn into a sellout. He pressures men into sinning. Both of them do. Now, the next thing, another similarity. Pay attention to the 13s. Both Jeroboam and the Antichrist are associated with the number 13. The famous chapter in Revelation about the Antichrist, Revelation 13. Judas Iscariot is a type of the Antichrist, and his name has 13 letters. The Antichrist has 13 letters. 13 is the number of rebellion in the King James Bible. Jeroboam. Huge rebel. King Jeroboam gets his hand dried up like the Antichrist in 1 Kings 13. You read more about him in 2 Chronicles 13. In the 13th verse of 2 Chronicles 13, Jeroboam is ambushing somebody. Just like the devil, always trying to run up on you. Always trying to corner you. 2 Kings 13, 13. But Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come up about behind them. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. Just like the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. It could go on and on. Both Jeroboam and the Antichrist associated with the number 13. And next, both push away a faithful remnant. The ways of Jeroboam were so abominable that it pushed away the people whose hearts sought the Lord. And God always has a faithful remnant who sees through the deceivableness of unrighteousness. And in Second Chronicles eleven thirteen through 17, it says, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and, and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jer Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. Remember, they, they made the priests that they wanted. And he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. You see, the priests are for devils. Jeroboam's priests are for devils. The Antichrist's priests are for devils. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. You see, those good men left the wicked man to go serve God, and they actually strengthened Rehoboam. Good men bring strength. Evil men bring weakness. Just like Jeroboam pushed away the men of God, the Antichrist pushes away a remnant. In Mark 13, 14, it says, But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. When the Jews see the Antichrist stand in the temple claiming to be God, they are going to know he's a fraud and they're going to flee. He's going to push away faithful men. The story of Jeroboam is tragic. 
God would have given him victory. He could have led Israel to be right with God. He chose the broad way to hell. He lost his son, and then King Abijah defeats him to the point that he never recovers strength, as it says in Second Chronicles 13.20. But you can learn a lot of things that you shouldn't do from King Jeroboam. In the Bible, there's characters where you learn what you should do. Jeroboam is one of those characters where you can learn what not to do. But I hope that you've gotten an interest in this character. I would suggest go back and reading 1 Kings 11, 26 through 14, 20 and 2 Chronicles 10 through, through chapter 13 and let all this I've said sink in and just really m put in memory this character, this outstanding character in the Bible that it will show you what not to do.